now via Skype from Red Hook, New York, Frank Miniter, the executive editor of American Hunter magazine and the author of the new book, The Future of the Gun. Frank, we welcome you back to America's Forum. I want to thank you for your time and I'd like to get your perspective as you're there uh, in New York, presumably close to the, uh, the border with Canada. Uh, reports were that the Canadian soldier who was killed was unarmed. How, how do you guard a monument without a weapon? I just think that's absolutely insane. And I'm hoping Canada will change that, that whatever uh, regulation he had to follow, not to actually have bullets when he's protecting uh, his, his own representatives, his own uh, parliament. Frank, let's talk about the sergeant at arms who stopped the gunman before he could kill more people. How do you think he was able to do this? Oh, what a hero. He has a long law enforcement background, but he knew how to use his firearm, how to get his firearm quickly. I, I wish he actually had it on him, but he was able to retrieve it very fast, and he made a good, clean shot. Uh, obviously, he practiced with that firearm, uh, and he's proficient with it. And just God bless him for being a hero and standing up and doing what, what all of us would like to do when, when that bad situation does occur. Yeah, he literally was the sergeant at arms. And while we think of that as a ceremonial role in so many legislative bodies in the Western world, he, he obviously was able to get the arms. We, we have a picture here again of the fallen soldier, Anthony Cirillo. And obviously he was called late as being a reservist from Hamilton, Ontario, called in to stand there at the tomb of the unknown at the Canadian War Memorial. That obviously was a great honor. And despite the fact we don't want to leave people with the impression that we're blaming uh, the guard, but, but the national policy there in Canada, so close to us, and yet a much more strict policy toward firearms and gun control. Uh, is yesterday a stark reminder that tough gun laws don't deter acts like this? Right. Canada's gone through these cycles. A few years ago, they actually scrapped their long gun registry after spending billions of dollars trying to register everybody's long guns, their hunting guns, and so on. They finally found out that it really doesn't work, and, and they scrapped it. So Canada's gone through this massive gun control uh, regime in order to, they're kind of pulling that back down and putting it to more common sense. And hopefully, you know, this is a tragedy that that person had to be disarmed, uh, no bullets in his gun, so he couldn't actually do his duty. Um, hopefully, they'll change that regulation and let people be the heroes that they really want to be. Frank, do you actually think that's going to happen, though? You know, right now they do have a, a conservative government, a conservative for Canada, uh, that has been fairly pro-gun. I, I, I would see this as changing. I, I really would. Um, have to see how that goes. I'm not uh, totally in touch with the Canadian Parliament at the moment, though I have written about Canada before and, and dealt with them, and I've hunted across Canada. Um, there's a huge gun-owning base, especially in Western Canada. There's a lot of common sense there, so I do see it changing. Well, in terms of the, the political landscape, those issues will be taken up. And you talked about uh, the fact that Stephen Harper is leading now a conservative government uh, in the Canadian Parliament. But, but I want to talk about, you're, you wrote the book, The Future of the Gun. I guess we could label this the future of terrorism. Yes, yesterday that attack was at a Canadian landmark. But it seems that we are seeing uh, evidence of what I would call micro-terrorism. In other words, any town, USA, any town, any place involving anybody. In your mind, given the changing face of terrorism, does that reiterate the need for personal protection in terms of a firearm? It does very much so. I think an armed citizen, for the most part, they're very responsible. If you look at the statistics, the uh, people who have a concealed carry, carry a handgun in the United States they're less likely to commit crimes, but according to some studies, than police officers are. Um, you know, it, it's actually hard to, when you look at those studies, really get a fine point of, of, of police officers been committing crimes and so on, such a small pool. But basically, they don't commit crimes. They're safe people uh, who just want to help, uh, who do not want to cause uh, trauma. As you look at, at people, uh, unfortunately, who have who've tried to mass kill and an armed citizen has responded to that, I've never found a case where the armed citizen has just sprayed bullets around where the anti gunners say and harmed civilians in the process. They've always held their fire. In fact, Gabby Giffords, uh, when, when that horrible event occurred, there were two people responding, armed citizens responding, who didn't fire their firearms because they just couldn't get close enough in time. Frank, do you think there should be any limits, though, when it comes to guns and the type of firearms, who's able to handle them? Because there have been shootings occurring all around this country where people are not mentally stable and a lot of people would argue they shouldn't 
been able to obtain a gun. Absolutely right. Uh, I support the, the instant background check system uh, to stop people from uh, getting firearms who shouldn't get firearms. Uh, right now, actually, the National Shooting Sports Foundation, which is the gun lobby, the trade association for firearms manufacturers, is lobbying state by state to get mental health records, those who are found by court of law to be mentally insane, to get those records put into the National Instant Background Check system so those people can't get a gun. That was tried to be, Congress tried to pass it. Lindsey Graham had a bill, and it was killed. It was tabled uh, by Harry Reid in the Senate. They wanted to pass universal background checks instead, which isn't what it sounds like, universal background checks. So it's very unfortunate that politics has killed very reasonable gun control uh, that could stop potentially these uh, people from getting firearms. Frank, only a minute remains. Uh, there's another device out there that doesn't use lethal force, but it has some elements of, I guess, we, guess we'd call it gunsmanship, and that is the taser device. Why a firearm over a taser? Well, a taser is a short range uh, weapon, uh, and it's not very accurate, and it's more difficult to use. That technology is coming, coming on, um, and, I, and I like that idea, uh, you know, non-lethal uh, alternatives for someone to protect themselves. That's wonderful. Um, but the technology is just not there yet. As I, I talk to people, technology experts and so on, about self-defense options, uh, it just the technology isn't there in a, in a real practical way for the average person to use yet. Frank Minotier, the executive editor of American Hunter magazine and the author of the new book, The Future of the Gun. Sir, we thank you for your time and insights about what happened yesterday in Canada. Anytime, J.D. Very good. Uh, good to have Frank along and good to get your thoughts on this. You heard what Frank had to say. Do you agree? Would Canada be better off with uh, more firearms in the hands of law-abiding citizens? Why don't you tweet me your comments at Newsmax TV, hashtag America's Forum. And America's Forum will continue following this Newsmax Now update.